Section 11 of The Destination of Man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte Translated by Jane Sinnott This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11 Faith Inward Voice all which exists for me presses on me by this relation only its existence and reality only by this do i apprehend it and i have no organ by which to apprehend any other existence to question whether indeed and in fact such a world is present as i present to myself can i give no more fundamental answer none more raised above doubt than this I have most certainly such and such determinate duties, and they cannot be otherwise fulfilled than in such a world as I represent to myself. Even to any who had never meditated on his moral destiny, if there should be such a one, or who had never formed any resolution concerning it, even with a view to an indefinite future, even for him, his sensual world and his belief in its reality arises in no other manner than from his ideas of a moral world if he should not apprehend this by the thoughts of his duties he certainly will by the demand for his rights what he does not require of himself he will certainly require of others that they should treat him with consideration not as an irrational thing but as a free and intelligent being and thus that they may be enabled to meet his own claims he will be necessitated to regard them also as free and independent of mere natural agency if he proposes to himself no other object in his relations to things surrounding him than that of enjoyment he at least requires this enjoyment as a right and demands from others that they should leave him undisturbed in this enjoyment and thus embraces even the world of sense in his moral idea these claims of regard for the preservation of his own existence for his freedom and rationality no one will willingly renounce and in his ideas of these claims at least is found earnestness and belief in reality and denial of doubt even if they are not associated with the acknowledgment of a moral law in his heart it is not therefore the operation of what we regard as things external which do indeed exist for us only inasmuch as we know of them and just as little the play of imagination and thought whose products as such are no more than empty pictures but the necessary faith in our own freedom and energy and in the reality of our actions and of certain laws of human action will lie at the root of all our consciousness of external reality a consciousness which is itself only belief founded on another unavoidable belief we are compelled to admit that we act and that we ought to act in a certain manner we are compelled to assume a certain sphere for this action this sphere is the actual world as we find it from the necessity of action proceeds the consciousness of the external world and not the reverse way from the consciousness of the external world to the necessity of action from the latter is the former deduced we do not act because we know but we know because we are destined to act practical reason is the root of all reason the laws of action for rational creatures are of immediate certainty and their world is only certain so far as these are so we cannot deny them without annihilating the world and ourselves with it we raise ourselves from nothing and maintain ourselves above it solely by our moral agency i am required to act but can i act without having in view something beyond the action itself without directing my intentions to something which could only be attained by my action can i will without willing some particular thing to every action is united in thought immediately and by the laws of thought itself 
some future existence, a state of being related to my action as effect to cause. This object of my action is not, however, to determine my mode of action. I am not to place the object before me, and then determine how I am to act that I may attain it. My action is not to be dependent on the object, but I am to act in a certain manner, merely because it is my duty so to act. This is the first point. That some consequence will follow this action I know, and this consequence necessarily becomes an object to me, since I am bound to perform the action which must bring it to pass. I will find that something shall happen, because I am to act so that it may happen. As I do not hunger because food is present, but a thing becomes food for me because I hunger, so I do not act thus or thus because a certain end is to be attained, but the end is to be attained since I must act in the manner to attain it. I do not observe a certain point and allow its position to determine the direction of my line and the angle that it shall make but I draw simply a right angle, and by that determine the points through which my line must pass. The end does not determine the commandment, the commandment the end. I say it is the law of my action itself which points out to me its object. The same inward voice that compels me to think I ought to act thus compels me also to believe that my action will have some result. It opens to my spiritual vision a prospect into another world, another and a better than that which is sensually present to me. It makes me aspire after this better world, embrace it with every impulse, live in it, and in it alone find satisfaction and tranquility. The law of my action guarantees to me the certain attainment of its object. The resolution to direct all my powers of life and thought to fulfill this law brings with it the immovable conviction that the promise implied in it is true and certain. As I live in obedience to it, I live also in the contemplation of its end, live in that better world which it foretells to me. Even in the mere consideration of the world as it is, apart from this law, I am conscious of the wish, the earnest desire, the absolute demand for a better. I cast a glance upon the present relations of mankind among themselves and to nature, upon the weakness of their powers, the strength of their passions and desires. I cannot think of the present state of humanity as one destined to be permanent as its entire and ultimate destination. Then indeed were all a dream and a delusion, and it would not be worth the toil of living to renew perpetually this idle game, tending to nothing, signifying nothing. Only inasmuch as I may contemplate it as the means to a better, as the transition point to a higher and more perfect state, does it obtain any value in my eyes not for its own sake but for the sake of that which it prepares us for can i support it esteem it and joyfully perform my part in it my mind can take no hold on the present world nor rest in it a moment but my whole nature rushes onward with irresistible force towards that future and better state of being shall i eat and drink only that i may hunger and thirst and eat and drink again till the grave which yawns beneath my feet shall swallow me up, and I myself become the food of worms? Shall I beget other beings in my likeness, that they may eat and drink and die, and leave behind them other beings to do the like? To what purpose this perpetually revolving circle, this everlasting repetition in which things are produced only to perish, and perish to be again produced? this monster continually swallows itself up that it may again bring itself forth and bringing itself forth only that it may again swallow itself up never never can this be my destiny or that of my race 
there must be something which is because it has become thus and remains permanently and can never become again and what is to endure must be brought forth in the changes of what is transitory and perishable and be carried forward safe and inviolate upon the waves of time our race still struggles for its subsistence and preservation with a resisting nature still is the larger portion of mankind condemned to severe toil in order to procure nourishment from itself and from the smaller portion which thinks for it immortal spirits are forced to fix their whole thoughts and endeavours on the ground that brings forth their food often does it happen that when the toil is finished and the labourer promises himself its long-lasting fruits a hostile element will destroy in a moment the results of long-continued industry and patient deliberation and cast him out a prey to misery and hunger storms floods volcanoes desolate whole countries and works bearing the impress of a rational soul are hurled with their authors into the wild chaos of death and destruction disease snatches into an untimely grave men in the pride of their strength and children whose existence has yet borne no fruit pestilence sweeps blooming lands and regions won from the wilderness by the toil of man becomes deserts again thus it is now and thus it shall be for ever no work bearing the stamp of reason and undertaking to enlarge her dominion can ever wholly perish the victory which the irregular violence of conflicting elements has obtained must at least tend to their exhaustion and ultimate reconciliation all those outbreaks of the power of nature before which the strength of man sinks into nothing those earthquakes those desolating hurricanes those volcanoes can be nothing more than the last struggles of the crude mass against the subjection to regular progressive laws to which it is compelled nothing but the last strokes of the not yet complete formulation of our globe that resistance must gradually become weaker and be at length exhausted since in the regular course of things there can be nothing to renew its strength that formulation must be at length completed and our destined dwelling be made ready nature must gradually attain such a point of development that her proceedings can be securely counted upon and that her power shall bear a determinate proportion to that which is destined to contract it that of man insomuch as this proportion has already been established the civilization obtained a firm footing the workings of man by their mere existence shall react on nature with a new and vivifying force beyond the intention of their authors the more regular and various culture of the soil shall give a new impulse to life and vegetation shall ameliorate and disperse the heavy and baneful vapors that hang over deserts marshes and primeval forests and the sun shall pour more animating rays into an atmosphere breathed by healthful industrious and cultivated nations science first awakened by the impulse of necessity shall now calmly study the unchangeable laws of nature and calculate their possible consequences and while closely following the steps of nature in the actual world form for itself a new ideal one every new discovery shall be retained and form the foundation for further knowledge and be added to an accumulating stock the common possession of our race nature shall become more and more intelligible and transparent light shall be thrown on her profoundest mysteries and human power armed by human invention shall exercise over her a boundless control and the conquest once made be peacefully maintained no further expenditure of mechanical toil shall be necessary than what the human body requires for its exercise and healthy development and work shall cease to be a burden for a reasonable being is not destined to be a bearer of burdens End of section 11